this a couple of days ago. Um, Saul had failed to be the leader God wanted him to be, or the people called for. We saw that in the First Samuel 17 story. And so um, uh, the Lord in 1 Samuel 16 had sent Samuel to Bethlehem, anointed David as king. And so from 1 Samuel 17 on, we're looking at these two and doing this. Who's got the best leadership skills? Who's got the best faith? Who's the smartest? All of that to, to, uh, to lead God's people of the past. Um, and um, when David's reputation soared after his defeat of Goliath and everybody followed him into that battle, uh, people started singing the song, Saul has killed his thousands, but David his ten thousands, and it will not go over well with someone like Saul. And so Saul immediately begins to look for ways to end David's life. He offers his daughter, Michael, in marriage to him. Doesn't sound like a way to take his life, except the bride price was a hundred that he would pay to show that he could, you know, the bride price is what the groom would present to the bride's family and say, look, I can take care of her. The bride price was a hundred Philistine foreskin. Okay. Is this recording? Good. Yes. <laughs> Is that a threat? Now, <laughs> suddenly this went from PG to R. <laughs> now, assuming the 100 Philistines aren't as willing to give up the foreskins as we might expect them not, but Saul's calculation is <laughs> these guys, David will never collect the bride price before he's dead. And, you know, he did. Mm -hmm. He did. And then Saul started to methodically try to execute him, throwing a spear at him, ordering his execution. David realizes, i got to get out of here, or I'm going to be dead. And so he goes out into the wilderness, he collects a sword from Nob, where uh, uh, the sword of Goliath was, grabs the sword of Goliath, comes down here into the wilderness, and for the next chapters we have a really hard time finding him. Mm -hmm. I've written an essay in the Discovery House Bible Atlas that talks about that. We run through this list of place names, many of which we can't identify. And I think the rhetorical purpose behind that is to make us feel like we're having trouble finding him. And that's the whole point. Saul was having trouble finding him, <laughs> which makes sense because David's life was spent partially here as a shepherd. He knew the ecosystem. Saul was a Benjaminite. He didn't know. He knew the high plateau. He didn't know this space at all. So David was much better at eluding him than Saul catching him unless he got help. And that's what we're going to see in 1 Samuel 24. Before we jump in there, let's think about what wilderness was doing for David. What this wilderness oasis was doing. Because 1 Samuel 24 says David was in the, in the, near the spring of En Gedi. So in this uh, ecosystem. Um, first of all, it's allowing him to survive in the wilderness, right? Uh, when we think of David in the wilderness, he can't be out here without making regular contact with a water source, without making contact with food reserves that he would harvest perhaps from Judah's hill country. So he is on the move, uh, evading Saul, but also having to make contact with uh, civilized Judean hill country to get grain, uh, maybe hunting some of the uh, Gedi out here, the Nubian Ibex for food, and then making contact with water. So one thing the wilderness is doing for David is it's allowing him to survive, sorry, one thing the oasis of En Gedi is doing for David, it's allowing him to survive in a place where otherwise he had not been able to do so. Number two, Deuteronomy 8, 2, and 3. We talked about it several days ago when we were out in Judah's wilderness, and we said, what does wilderness do for people? And we looked at how Moses described the role of uh, wilderness of a different space, but the same ecosystem in the life of Israel for 40 years. Do you remember what the trilogy was? It Humbled. Humbled, right? Which is what wilderness does. Takes you down a notch or two. You realize that your skill set doesn't match the ecosystem. Two, it tests. Tests to show how much, and how much and what you're able to do. It reveals to yourself. And third, it teaches. Teaches, teaches divine sufficiency. And so as David is out here in this place, the wilderness does exactly what it did for Israel uh, in the 40 years of the Sinai wilderness. Judean wilderness is humbling him. And he needed a little bit of that. Go back and read 1 Samuel 17 and observe the ways in which um, he comes across as a little edgy. What will be done for the man who takes this on? You know, <laughs> There's a bit of bravado there that really needs to be 
pulled off the edges. It, taught, it, it uh, tested him uh, to demonstrate what sort of faith he had, and it taught him divine sufficiency. So I would argue that not only did wilderness sustain him during that time, uh, it also accomplished the, the second roles of humbling and testing and teaching. How are you guys this morning? Um, the third thing that it's going to do, uh, the third thing that it's going to do is where I'd like to put our emphasis in 2 Samuel. Demonstrate, it will demonstrate his faith. It will demonstrate his faith. I'd like to dig in a little closer on the text to give you a sense for it. 1 Samuel 24. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told David is in the desert of En Gedi. And so now we have a proper name that associates it more specifically with a place. So Saul took 3,000 able young men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goat. The the cliff faces that surround this, this nature reserve, where the Gedi, or the wild goats, are located. Now the number 6,000 is important because we know how many David has with him. Anybody know from memory? 300? 600. 600. 600 by this time. Can you do the math? He is outnumbered 5-ish to 1 plus, right? So we're uh, 5 to 1. So. David is not out here looking for a fight. He's out here trying to secret himself away because he's way outnumbered uh, in this space. He came to the sheep pens along the way and a cave was there and Saul went in to relieve himself. Still recording, aren't we? All good. David and his, and his men were far back in the cave. And at that point of the story, if it's our first read, we're going, uh-oh. <laughs> because Dead Sea stories can be stories of divine judgment and death. And boy, if there looks like divine judgment and death coming, this looks like it. This is, you know, David and his men were back in the cave. They must have been surprised. Because otherwise, the better chance for you is to keep going. Get deeper into this wilderness rather than put yourself in a cave where you're where you're locked down. So they must have been really worried that they were put in a bad situation there. And you can imagine everybody shushing one another and saying, quiet, quiet. And Saul walks in. And everybody is just like, this is it. This is it. The moment we get to get out of the wilderness. I mean, if this isn't the pathway out of the wilderness, right over the dead body of this guy, I don't know what is. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I'll give your enemy in your hand, into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. So David has the support of his colleagues who are seeing this as their ticket out of wilderness, as well as David's advance to the throne. David crept up unnoticed. The storytelling slows. He pulls out the sword of Goliath. And just when we cover our eyes and think Saul's blood is about to be spattered over the cave wall, he cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterward, David was conscience-stricken for cutting off a corner of the robe, and he said to the men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Uh, David looked at this and said, Unless I have a clearer indication than this, that this is the moment that I'm supposed to replace Saul, I won't do it. I'm not going to advance the time, um, timetable. And with these words, David sharply rebuked his men. What were they ready to do? You're not going to do it? We will. Yeah. And he did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way. It's just unthinkable, you know. But it's the a, it's a first step in this demonstration of faith in this wilderness context. David, given this opportunity, says, pass. I am going to wait for the Lord's timing. Then David went out of the cave and called to Saul. That's a pretty leave, but David goes out and gives their position away. Think about that. You're in a cave outnumbered five to one? I don't like this. Mm. David went out of the cave and called to Saul, my lord the king. And when David, Saul looked back toward him, David bowed and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. This is not fighting position. David is not the gunslinger calling him out at high noon into the street and saying, let's have at this. <laughs> he goes face down on the ground. Mm. 
He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you've seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lay my hand on the Lord, my Lord, because he is the Lord's anointed, capital L, Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe and did not kill you. Well, it, it's obvious, right? If I'm close enough to get this off your garment, you're distracted using the bathroom. You know, this was your last day. You just got that. I cut off the corner of your robe but did not kill you. See, there's nothing in my hand to indicate I'm guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. I have not wronged you, but you're hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrong you've done to me, but my hands will not touch you. Mm. As the old saying goes, from evil do uh, doers come evil deeds, so my hand will not touch you. Against whom is it? He keeps going. Against whom? It's like he's getting this long lecture, and we're thinking, David, do you realize what you're doing? Against whom has the king of Israel come out? What are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. <coughs> mm. That is faith in action. What had happened to David between his time in court and wilderness shows up here. He is a guy who's different than he was before, and he's different than he was before because the wilderness had humbled him and tested him and taught him. His men saw it, and Saul saw it. When David finished saying this, Saul answered, Is that your voice, David, my yeah. son? And he wept aloud. You are more righteous than I. You've treated me well, but I've treated you badly. You just now told me about the good you did to me. And the Lord delivered you into my hand, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away and harm me? The Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. Listen to where he goes now. I know that you surely will be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Mm. Whoa, is that a dramatic shift? Saul had been both verbally and by his actions denying the divine plan and saying, I will not surrender the throne. I am going to hold this and I'm going to execute David if I have to to hold on to it. And now he steps away from that. And unfortunately, he doesn't stay there. But for the moment, David's faith witness changed his arch enemy. And I think there's such a powerful takeaway here. For us because um, as we mentioned a couple of days ago uh, seasons of wilderness look a lot like this wilderness a place where we feel outmatched where we feel like we don't have enough to get through uh, the week much, uh, much less the month or the or the year and um, when those seasons come, when relationships break down, when there's a loss of a loved one, when there's um, an illness uh, that, that uh, devastates our health and well-being, it feels like wilderness. Hello. How are you folks? Beautiful morning. Beautiful morning with beautiful water. And welcome yeah. to Israel. Uh, thanks. Hey. Thanks. I'm glad you guys are enjoying your day too. Did you see birds? You look yes. like you're ready to take bull bull. Yes. One yeah, little and one big. Ah, good. Good. I always meet my people back here. Yeah, it's not like the tourist stop. <laughs> um, so, uh, when I enter a season of wilderness, I know that others will be watching to see how I handle it. Mm. You know? Am I going to get angry? Am I going to get resentful? Uh, am I going to lash out at God? Um, and I, I just am reminded that these are unique times that the Lord gives me to give a faith witness that's very powerful to those around me. Um, and if they see me, by the grace of God, handling that well, right, David, here in the wilderness, uh, it can change people at a most fundamental level. It changed David's men. They didn't try to kill Saul. It changed Saul. And and, and if uh, and, uh, I, I just pray that when the Lord puts me in that season of wilderness, 
that I might have the wherewithal to stay there as long as he needs me to be there, to humble me and test me and teach me, but then to give that good best faith witness from that space. Uh, he knows how long I can afford to be there, and maybe part of my being there is exactly for the reason David was here, to give a faith witness to Saul. Uh, maybe that's my legacy of being at that time in the wilderness as well. So it, it speaks to me through time, even as it speaks through this wilderness ecosystem, which looks a lot like my season of wilderness as well.